Hello everyone to this uh, second presentation of day two of Adobe Data World 2016, the online conference for marketing and technical communication professionals. We have Jan Grat in the room and he will talk about Data 1.3 and Framework 2015, a match made in heaven. That's what he says and I agree with that. And I stop my sharing of that slide now and hand over to Jan so that he can start sharing his screen. It's all yours, okay. your stage, young, your show, you're in the center of the universe now. <laughs> it's my show. That's good to hear. <laughs> okay, let me first select the right screen because otherwise you're not getting what you came for. Here we go. Go. Cool. We can see your screen. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, you can see my frame maker, right? So, but before we dive into FrameMaker, I want to show you a couple of slides that I prepared for today. Um, and that is, let me just start this. Okay, so um, if if the slideshow is not showing up, Stefan, you got to shout because then I need to find another way because this is using all my, uh, the entire screen. I don't know how that works with Adobe Connect. I haven't tried it yet, but there's always a first time to try anything, right? So here we go. Good, wonderful. I love technology when it works. <clears throat> so welcome everybody in, uh, in this uh, session today. Um, I know that a lot of people have been talking already about DITA, about FrameMaker, about all kinds of goodies in that package. And I'm going to concentrate on a combination of two technologies that I have spent, uh, let's say, you know, the last 10 years with. Uh, one is DITA, uh, starting with the, uh, well, I, when I started, when I came into DITA, uh, it was 1.1 uh, was just being released, I think. And now we're at 1.3. Uh, FrameMaker, um, my experience with FrameMaker goes back to FrameMaker 7.0, I think, or even before that. So a lot has happened since then. <clears throat> And um, as I said, in the past uh, 10 years, I've been dealing with FrameMaker and DITA. And basically in the last year, I've only been using DITA 1.3 in combination with FrameMaker 2015. So that's why um, I thought let's give this, um, this presentation a catchy title, a match made in XML heaven. So um, very briefly, I'm gonna talk about myself. Uh, many of you, uh, have probably uh, seen me uh, present before at one of the conferences. Been doing this for uh, about 15 years now. Um, I am what some people refer to as the geek philosopher, uh, meaning, well, basically, I studied philosophy and I always tried to look for strong concepts in technology. Technology is no good if it's not if it's not based on very strong, clear concepts, in my view. Um, also. In the, um, in the past 15 years that I've been working with FrameMaker, um, I've come to earn uh, like a nickname, the Frame Tamer, because I, basically I make FrameMaker do all kinds of stuff that it wasn't designed to do. And as uh, Stefan already mentioned, already uh, seen, you know, I've been using this as my middle initials. My parents, a uh, long time ago, apparently, already knew what, what I was going to do later in life. So they gave me those middle initials, Ferdinand Maria, which comes down to FrameMaker today. So since uh, early 2015, um, uh, I've been working with uh, my good friend, Tom Aldous, who has been talking yesterday and whom uh, most of you already know. Um, after he left uh, Acrolynx, he started his own company, the content era, and he asked me to join him to do all kinds of geek stuff. And, you know, since I love doing geek stuff, that was just a job for me. So that's enough about, about the company and about me. Let's first look at why you would use DITA in the first place. Um, many of you will already know DITA, uh, may already be working with DITA. For those of you who haven't uh, gotten the chance to work with DITA yet, it might be, um, you know, kind of vague, you know, what is this thing all about? What is DITA all about? And as I mentioned, I'm 
always looking at strong concepts more than anything else. So <clears throat> uh, why use DITA in the first place? That's the first question I'm going to briefly talk about. Well, basically, DITA is the only truly extensible XML standard. As everybody probably knows, XML means extensible markup language, which comes down to you being able to extend the language, the vocabulary of your, oops, sorry, now my presentation is gone, I guess. I was looking at a, at a chat window here, but that doesn't work together with the presentation. So let me get back to keynote, there we go, okay. So extensible markup language, meaning that uh, instead of having, for example, HTML5 or uh, something HTML before uh, HTML5, you had uh, H1, H2 for headers, etc., and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just, those are just the tags you have and you have to work with them. In XML, you can define your own tags so that you use stuff that is more semantically rich, more meaningful for your organization. And as it happens, you know, XML was uh, started around the, uh, the millennium. And then since then, hundreds of XML vocabularies were created. Hundreds of XML standards exist now today. And most of them just define a fixed set of elements. This is true for S1000D, it's true for DocBook, it's true for all kinds of standards that are being used. It's not true for DITA. DITA is a unique uh, standard in that it allows you to extend the standard without uh, hurting it. Basically, you stay within the standard even when you make up your own vocabulary. So why is this such an important thing? Well, Specialization, as we, you know, that is, that is what it is called. If you create your own tags and you add them to XML, um, that is called specialization. And this is really referring to the D in DITA. D stands for Darwin, of course, evolution theory. Specialization is all around this. It's everywhere. And specialization makes species fitter for survival. This particular bird, and, you know, coincidence doesn't really exist. When I grew up, I lived in a street that was called a crossbill street. And here you go. This is one of the examples of survival of the fittest. This little bird is not, like, handicapped because of its strange beak. No, it, it would be handicapped in the desert or in open fields because that there it's not really... Uh, good to have this kind of, of you know, cross peak. But when it lives in, in uh, where it lives in the pine woods, it can very easily pry out all the seeds from the pineapples. And this is exactly what makes this bird so well, uh, uh, well adjusted to that particular environment. And it goes to show that uh, no matter what kind of thing, what kind of characteristic you might uh, come up with, it will be better than anything else in a certain environment. It also means that there is no such thing as one tool that serves all possible purposes. It's simply not going to happen. You will have to have special tools for special environments, for special jobs. This is the reason why if you go into uh, a Home Depot, you will find rows and rows and rows of all kinds of equi equipment, you know, the craziest stuff they sell there because one part of equipment is good for one thing, another part is good for another thing. And this is also true for XML and it's especially true for DITA. So if you decide to create your own tags, instead of sticking with the standard tags that you already have available, like in HTML4, um, you might have a B, an I element, etc to indicate bold and italic. Those tags are really uh, not semantic at all. They just indicate this, this is formatting based. So it's italic or it's bold or it's bold italic, right? Instead of that, if you look at the paragraph below that, you will see tag names that are meaningful. 
and they don't talk about formatting. The formatting is not the not the the, the basis of your markup. The markup is done with semantic labels. So par name would be well, basically, you know, everybody understands that's a parameter name, right? A menu cascade is a number of UI controls, uh, one after the other. Um, so uh, in this case, keynote is at the top, and then you have preferences, and then you have remotes. You know, everybody understands that if you look at the semantics. And then um, you can add, as I said, in, in Dita, you can add your own semantics to it. You can add your own specific tags and still remain within the standard. That's a really, really beautiful thing about DITA. And this is why DITA is better for technical documentation than anything else. And basically, it would also be good for a lot of other applications as well. But since we're in technical documentation, that's where DITA can really shine, or, and it can make you shine. So if you have your markup set correctly, instead of doing the format-based markup, you do semantically rich markup, then uh, this enables not only uh, um, uh, flexibility in the formatting, you could format something differently in different situations based on the same tags, but you can all also use the knowledge, the semantics in your markup in specific applications that understand that markup. So if I go back to the previous slide, you see here that there is something called an app. There's uh, at the bottom, there's this, uh, this keynote application, right? And I surrounded it with tags that say app. Now these are my own tags. You know, the app is, doesn't exist in Gita. I invented it and then uh, when I create this file, I push this file to a help system and maybe my help system knows what to do with a word that is surrounded by the tags app because it knows, hey, this points to an application that is here on the system and I can make a show me button out of that. And if I click that button, it will go to the application and it will open it up and it will show you exactly what we're talking about. And this would not be possible if, you're, if this, this word keynote was surrounded by italics, because then, you know, how is your application going to know what to do with it? So the markup becomes semantically rich. It becomes extra metadata, if you will, that you can add into the text without ever uh, uh, needing all kinds of special formatting, et cetera, to make it work, you know, without becoming... Uh, pushing yourself out into onto an island where non, no application can read your material. Okay, I'm not saying this is going to be automatic, but you have the potential to make that work. Now, as I said, you can add your own tags, but of course there has to be a rule about this because what you do not want to do is add such add tags in such a way that other applications that are processing your content, let's say you're creating your content. Uh, well, let's say I'm creating this content in Notepad++, right? And then I push it into FrameMaker and FrameMaker doesn't know what an app is, right? I didn't tell FrameMaker what this app keyword, what it really means, what it stands for. So to avoid problems with FrameMaker breaking down or another application breaking down because it chokes on a word that it doesn't, doesn't know. To avoid that, in DITA, uh, the, the, the technology that was defined in DITA is called specialization. And in specialization, every new tag that you add points back to the original uh, term, the original tag that you derived it from, the original tag that was in the data standard, right? So um, adding your own tags is totally legal uh, as long as you do it in the way that was designed into data, where you point to, you point back to your ancestor. This is also why, you know, this is also another reason of why D for Darwin is in that name data. 
you point back to your ancestors. So app is derived from term. And now if FrameMaker opens up this piece of text and it sees this app tag, it can also find, okay, app, oh, this is a specialization of term. Well, I don't know what is special about app, but I'll treat it like a term. And then it will still work. It will not break down. Okay, so this is, that's basically, that's in a nutshell. That is why Ditta is so hugely important for uh, technical documentation or for any kind of information because of its built-in metadata and because of the ability to extend the, the, the language without ever breaking anything down the road. All the tools will be able to process your specialized data, even if you have added all kinds of tags to it. So this was true from the beginning, from DITA 1.0. And, um, you know, why would we want to move to DITA 1.3? Why has there been um, an, a steady evolution from DITA 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2 to 1.3? Well, um, this happened because DITA was being applied to more and more business domains. And like in DITA 1.2, uh, the learning domain was added. And that was a huge uh, number of elements that came into play. In DITA 1.3, there's, there's a couple of new learning and learning interaction base that's uh, especially for all kinds of quizzes, et cetera, online quizzes. Um, but also we uh, see release management coming into play. Uh, SVG has been added. There's an XML mentioned domain. So there's lots and lots of new domains and these domains keep being, uh, being added to DITA because of the success of DITA for documentation because it is spreading into more and more domains. Um, and this means that, uh, you know, if you're now working in um, some kind of scientific environment, you can use MathML right into your, in, inside of your DITA documentation, you don't have to create the equations externally and then pull them in uh, as a graphic, which cannot be edited anymore. You can add the MathML right in there. So this is an example of how data keeps evolving, it keeps growing, and it keeps being applied to more and more different kinds of business domains. And this means that you will have more and more domains being added to data as those specializations become uh, useful enough to be taken into the standard instead of just being, you know, private specializations. Okay, so that's the, basically that is all I'm, I'm going to say about DITA and about DITA 1.3. If you want to know everything about DITA, uh, you can uh, find your sources online, or if you're smart, you book a, a ticket to Munich where there's a DITA Europe conference in just uh, just you know just two weeks away from now, it's November fourteenth and fifteenth, and um, and also I will be presenting there. I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. So let's look at FrameMaker. So why do I think that FrameMaker is a perfect environment to use for data? Well, basically. I think it's good for any kind of XML that you want to do, especially if you're in some kind of documentation domain. Then why would you, uh, you know, move to XML and then at the same time kick out all of your uh, comfortable tools and environments, etc., that you're used to, and start working in some kind of crazy, geeky XML environment? So. FrameMaker has been around for a long, long time. And what a lot of people do not know is that FrameMaker was one of the very first editors that was available with XML. So that could handle XML files. Even before XML, when we had SGML, the precursor to XML and HTML and all those markup languages, even with SGML, FrameMaker already uh, jumped on that track and created a FrameMaker SGML version. So you could do structured authoring in FrameMaker even before XML even existed. 
right? A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people, if they look at FrameMaker, they think, okay, this is for unstructured, unstructured uh, authoring only. And if I want to do XML, I need to get another tool. I need to get one of those XML editors. And that's simply not true. FrameMaker was, used, was supporting XML before most of current day XML specialized uh, editors even existed. And it's doing a really good job because it is not geeky. It is not driving your authors uh, up the walls if they are not used to XML editing. It is author friendly, it's versatile. So there is no reason to leave your comfortable, comfortable environment behind um, when you move into structured authoring. I prefer talking about structured authoring instead of XML authoring, because it's not about those tags. It is not about uh, the specific markup that you're using. Even though, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of DITA, but I don't need to have DITA in my face, those angular brackets in my face all the time. Why this is uh, an important thing to stress is I'm talking to a lot of people in the field and a lot of people uh, jump to the wrong conclusion if they think about structured authoring, they, they think about XML authoring and they say, it's got to be geeky, it's got to show all those tags and you have to teach your authors XML because otherwise it will never work out. Well, if that were true, then this wouldn't exist either. Then we would still be running around in 4T models because, you know, uh, it's simply it's simply a fallacy to think that high tech should look high tech. You know, this is probably the most uh, the most advanced vehicle on the planet, and it looks so slick and it is so easy to ride it. You know, because it has hidden all the technology. Uh, under the hood, well, even under the hood, in this case, there's only air. You know, the technology is completely hidden. It has become extremely user friendly, and it it doesn't make people uh, go, uh, you know, uh, become uneasy with all the angular brackets that are around it, etc. So, why advanced tools should look geeky beats me. I don't think they should. I think they they can look uh, author friendly and comfortable. And that's really true with FrameMaker. And then of course, there's the publishing side. A lot of people have moved to the, uh, to DITA, to uh, some kind of uh, geeky uh, XML editing environment. And now they have to put, publish everything through the DITA open toolkit because it's free and nothing really is free because they spend days and months and cetera to try and tweak the output just to get it you know to, to get it right so that if you leave framemaker behind when doing structured authoring then you leave behind this track record for publishing that framemaker has held for a long long time because they are good at publishing and they are getting better especially in the world of online media, et cetera. Nowadays, you have all of these media, all of these formats that you can produce out of the same source from FrameMaker with one push on a button. It's so easy. So um, there's even more than that. Uh, Tom mentioned this yesterday and uh, Wim Hawkwick was talking about also about the conversion. Um, what we do at the Common Era is uh, we bring a lot of companies from unstructured FrameMaker or Word or anything else into structured authoring. And we're using FrameMaker because this doesn't disrupt the whole process. A company cannot afford to stop the presses for a year and then continue with their structured content. And this is what would be required if you move to a completely XML based um, uh, editing and authoring and publishing uh, platform. With FrameMaker, you can just uh, convert one file at a time and just keep publishing all the time. It never breaks its ability to publish. FrameMaker can handle structured and unstructured content in the same book, no problem. I have even done some projects where we had structured and unstructured 
content in the same framework of file, and that didn't break the product. So it's really strong, and it really allows you to move gradually, move your content one by one over to a structured world uh, without ever stopping and without ever breaking your publication uh, chain, which you have invested lots of time and effort and money into. So let's look at why this combination, the specific combination between Dita and FrameMaker is so good. On the one hand, we have Dita content. We have uh, Dita that is defined by DTD, document type definition, doc, uh, um, specific, specification. And if you want to change something in Dita, you got to change a DTD. Now on the FrameMaker side, since FrameMaker had already been working with um, with HTML and then before you know before XML even existed and way before Dita even existed, the solution that was found at that point was um, an EDD, which is an element definition document. After all, FrameMaker is not so much a you know it's not like you can you do markup like you would do a Notepad and then you push it out to some kind of publication chain that somehow makes it into PDF or anything else. Now, FrameMaker was made for publication, for uh, making it look good on paper, as well as on all those different output formats that we have nowadays. So in FrameMaker, the template is what brings styles and element definition together. So structure and styles are combined into a template and the template defines not only uh, what the allowed elements are, which would be the function of a DTD, but it also adds uh, what is this element going to look like in this particular environment, in this particular context. And this is where the styles come in. And those styles are also defined in the template. So what happens is in the EDD, you define your structure rules, and in the structure rules, you also call out different kinds of formats, and those formats are defined in the template. So the template brings together those, those two aspects of authoring, the structure and the formatting. So if we look at the, um, the EDD, you know, this EDD being separate from the DTD, it's really a big plus, it's a real advantage. And I've, I've been using this advantage uh, with many, many projects in the past. Because what you can do is you can change the EDD without having to ever touch the DTD. Now, why would that be useful? Well, basically, you know, if I do not introduce new elements in my EDD that have no um, representation in the DTD, um, then, then I'm, I'm causing trouble. Then I have to do specialization. I cannot introduce new elements in EDD unless if I map them back to something in the DTD. But if I just want to hide some elements, I don't want to have all the elements from the data DTDs for my authors because there's uh, about 300 and, and I think the last time I counted, there were 364 elements. Nobody needs 364 elements. That is just totally outrageous. And it was never meant to be used completely in uh, as a whole. But if you want to do configuration and, and constraints in DITA, that's a geeky job. You have to edit DTDs. You have to know exactly what you're doing. On the EDD side, you can simply hide some elements so that your authors are not overwhelmed by the the, the, the rich vocabulary in DITA, and they're still going to be within the DITA space. So they're still going to be within that standard. So you don't need formal DITA constraints. You don't need DTD work to limit the available elements. Also, what we can do, and what we have been doing in a number of projects, is we hide a number of attributes that none of our customers is ever going to need. Class attribute is required in DITA but you don't have to have it in your face. You can hide it in the EDD. Um, elements like attributes like XTRC, XTRF, uh, 
direction, etc. All kinds of attributes can be hidden. So it means it's exactly the same, but uh, so it, it, it's it's a subset of what you're what you have in Dita without really subsetting Dita at all. You just hide some stuff, and then your authors are going to be happier. So there's another point where you can even go further is where you can design your own tags and then you create read write rules read write rules are always there if you write out from framemaker to xml it uses read write rules to decide okay what's going to happen to the element uh, the framemaker element article oh i know i'm going to translate it into the data element topic and then it's all good so if my authors are used to calling it article with a section and a subsection, then hey, why can I not keep using those tags and then just automatically translate them whenever I write out to XML, to DITA? So that's uh, another reason why uh, having this separate area of EDD and uh, your, you know, your own set of tags inside of FrameMaker is really an advantage. It's like automatic translation between the FrameMaker world and the formal DITA world. Uh, it's the same thing, but it uses different words or tags, and it just goes without any uh, any effort at all. Just hit, hit save, and it's going to be pushed into standard DITA with all the standard attributes and elements. So. If this is not enough, because in some cases, you might need to introduce elements that you want to use on the FrameMaker side, but they shouldn't be available on the DITA side because it's, you know, and they're in a different order, et cetera. This is where you can use XSLT for automatic transforms. So when you write out from FrameMaker to DITA, you use a, a post-processing XSLT, XSL uh, style sheet. If you're reading from DITA or any other XML into FrameMaker, you're using another XSL. That's for the pre-processing. And these are defined in the, uh, in the settings of FrameMaker in your so-called structured application, and they run automatically behind the scenes. You don't have to call them out specifically. It's all automatic. So with this, um, as one example, I'm not going to show you that in real life, but with this, we have been able to pull um, uh, to pull a single docbook file that it consisted of seventy thousand lines and is very very hard to and cumbersome to edit. We pull that into a book with four hundred separate FrameMaker XML topics, and we push it back out into the single docbook X docbook file again at the end of the day. So. This is a very, very powerful feature of FrameMaker that you can use. This is for the, you know, that's more for the advanced stuff that you might want to use. So, okay, this is all good about FrameMaker and about, you know, this is gen general for FrameMaker since they invented the EDD, et cetera. This has been in place and they've been added, you know, Adobe has been adding the XSLT uh, um, performance to it and all kinds of, of goodies to it. So why is it so good to work with FrameMaker 2015? And why, if, if anybody in the audience is not using FrameMaker 2015 yet, and they're, they're, they're using DITA, then they must be, you know, quite masochistic, you know, because before Frame, FrameMaker 2015, using DITA was not much fun, I can tell you. I've been there, I've done that, and it was, it was sometimes a real hassle. I've been, I've brought FrameMaker to its knees quite a lot of times trying to do just legal stuff, but the support for data was simply, you know, technically it wasn't good yet. It wasn't good enough. In data 1.3, the EDDs have been completely redesigned from the ground up. This is why I have this drawing board uh, uh, image here because, well, uh, you know, some of you already know that, but I've been I've been working on those EDDs personally for Adobe. Um, and as I said way in the beginning of my presentation, I like strong concepts. And 
that's what I put in there. So what, ha what has happened to the EDDs is they've been completely redesigned. Uh, there's only one level of, uh, of uh, text insets there. And there's a whole bunch of extras in there that help you configure your EDDs in the, in the easiest possible way. I'm using, we're using conditional text to exclude domains. So instead of, uh, instead of kicking out the, the entire module, you can simply hide it by using conditional text. And then, um, of course, this calls for a powerful uh, condition, conditional text processing. And this has become available in um, FrameMaker, I think it was FrameMaker uh, 11, where it was really, really good. You know, this, this has really been improved in FrameMaker 11. And then it got stronger after that. There's a full expression builder with a whole logic uh, definition of what you want to filter out of your content. And this has been applied extensively to the EDDs. Then there's also uh, a whole bunch of variables that hold um, uh, lists of, um, of individual elements that you might need to kick out. And I'm, I'm going to show you something. Uh, I'm going to show you this in real life in a demo at the end of my talk, um, which is approaching really rapidly because, you know, I can talk about it for a couple of hours, but it's better to show it to you just in 10 minutes. So um, with all the information that I've given you and with, uh, you know, based on, on my insight of uh, working with FrameMaker uh, a lot in the past 10 years, working with Dita for the past 10 years, I really think that uh, there's no good reason to get away from FrameMaker if you're planning to use uh, structured uh, authoring for your technical documentation. And there is no reason at all to not use DITA 1.3 to do it. Because this is simply the, the, the best uh, platform that you can work with um, for technical documentation. And basically for more than that, e even for marketing information, for any kind of information that you want to um, to create and publish, this is just the best platform available at the moment. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to uh, look at FrameMaker itself, and I'm going to show you a couple of things that I've been talking about. So um, one thing here is uh, I talked about the EDDs. Right, and how they have. Um, I'm going to open one of those EDDs and um, one of those EDDs. Let's uh, take the, uh, the concept EDD because that's what I'm going to show you in a small demo a little bit later as well. So, if we look at the, um, the EDD here, you see that it's uh, very nicely organized, you, we have one section per domain. And as you can see, DITA has a lot of domains. You know, and all of those domains are, um, are optional, except for the ones that define the basics. So here you have the required modules. So this is a module, this module, the, the, the topic.eddmod.fm, that's uh, required. This one is required. Common elements, table declarations, meta declarations, and here we have the concept uh, specific elements. Then we have a number of modules that are, they, they are optional, so they can be included or excluded. And uh, when I was creating this, uh, these EDDs, I included these words, which are also tagged with conditional tags. You can see the conditional tags down here. So this one, is abbreviated domain, and the word included is wrapped into condition tag domain abrev abrev dash d. Abrev dash d is exactly what it's called like in the data materials. So this means that you have so there's domain dash, and then I use the name that the domain has in the official data DTDs, just to be you know to be on the safe side, so that you always know what you're talking about. 
Okay, so all of these are uh, defined here in the introduction to the EDD. And then you have condition text settings where it has a number of extra settings like non-domain settings. Topic nesting is switched on. You can see that here. Info types, I'm only using concept. I could also include other kinds of types. For those of you who know a little bit more about data and about configuration, they will understand that. And for those of you who don't understand that, you know, that's all going to be clear uh, once you start working with it. Uh, base topic, base concept, these are okay uh, because they're required on. These are required off. And in the required off, what I've done is if I have something that is included, which should be excluded, then a word not will appear here simply by using conditional tags, right? And then after that, we have the whole set of, of uh, modules. We have all kinds of definitions here. Let's go down here and you will see that all of those are wrapped into condition tags that make everything work. Okay. So I have a lot of conditions. I can even, you know, I can make this a bit larger and I can show you here that this is, this is a long list of conditions that were put in there. It was a lot of work. With these conditions, it has now become really simple to create a constraint. And a constraint, well, there's configuration, which means you kick out an entire domain, an entire domain. Um, and doing that, there's also uh, um, um, individual, you know, you can kick out individual elements and that's going to be done through variables. That's, there's a whole lot of variables here, but that is too specific to go into much detail in this, uh, in this hour that I have here. So let's uh, look at this. Um, to create a constraint, what I do is I open the, the expression builder that you can see here. And here you see that these domains are excluded. And if I do not want to have the abbreviate domain, then what I do is double click here and I have to put the word or in between. I click save, close this and apply. So now it's applying the condition, the new condition expression. It's taking a little time because it goes through the entire file to make sure that no incorrect references still exist. And then when I go up to the top of the file, you will see abbreviate domain is not, no longer included. But this is, this is really easy to kick out uh, those, those individual um, domains. Now, this is a method that, uh, of course, I have to exclude, the, I have to create the build expression. Then before I, I, um, before I, I uh, import this into the template to make it work, I have to run a validation because it might be that there's a little mistake in one of those EDDs. So I have to run validation. Well, this document is valid and now I can save the EDD and I can import it into the template. Okay. So, all of those actions are, you have to run those actions one after the other in a strict uh, order. And it has to be done in the right way. Otherwise you're creating uh, all kinds of mess. So what I've done after creating those EDDs for Adobe, and this is something that is another advantage of the FrameMaker environment. In FrameMaker, you can do scripting. And what I've created is a script that really helps me do all of the work. Okay, my window went to another. Okay, so I start this script and it gives me this shell, uh, shell selection and I'm going to select the concept. Now let me cancel that out and first show you what the concept looks like currently. So if I start a new concept, then what you can see here is that in the elements catalog, there's a whole bunch of elements that I can use in a paragraph. There's too many for most authors because this is including all the domains that I have available in data. Now, if I start creating those constraints, then what happens is if I select the concept, I'm going to click OK. It's going to give me a window with all the domains that are available 
that I can switch off. And let me just do that. Let me just select none here and click OK. And now it's going to, there is a progress dialog, but it's showing up on my other screen, so you cannot see it. It's applying the conditional build expression. It's doing a lot of work. It's now validating the conditionalized EDD because, you know, you don't want to uh, import a, an invalid EDD into your template. It is opening the template in the background. It knows where the template is. It's importing the EDD into the template, saving the template, and all is good. So now, if I open a new, if I create a new concept, it's going to use the same template, but now the template has changed. But what happens now if I go here to this paragraph, you see that? This is in the paragraph, and you have only this many elements available. And it's a whole lot less than when I was in this topic. There's many more in there, right? Now, I may want to, and you can see here at the top, I put this uh, this this time stamp so that you can see this was the one that was 6.44 p.m. and this was 6.45 p.m. So it has changed the template, right? Okay, now if I go in here again, create the data constraints, I'm choosing the concept. Now, I might want to use the highlighting domain, but not everything. So if I click this, I can open the elements from there and those elements, I can select none, but I do want to have this superscript and the subscript because all of the others are just formatting, but these are really, you know, I cannot do without it. So I'm gonna click on that. If I don't know what these domains do, I can click on the question mark and it will show me a little bit of text that says what that domain entails. Click okay, and it's gonna do the same thing again, apply the conditional build expression, validate the EDD, then import the EDD into the template. It's taking a little while to validate. These are, these are quite extensive files. Um, while working on this, I've had a couple of cases where uh, I crashed FrameMaker and they had to change something in the internals of the program because they never thought that somebody would have a couple of thousand um, conditional tags, tag snippets into their, in their uh, EDD. So here you go, now we have everything available, well, only the basic terms available plus the subscript and the superscript. And this is how easy it becomes to create constraints inside of data. Okay, same thing goes for uh, attributes. You can switch off individual attributes uh, just the same way. And this is all possible because you have the strong basis of uh, data implementation. You have the separate EDD in FrameMaker. And if you can make changes to the EDD without ever specializing or constraining or you know doing all kinds of nasty stuff to the DTDs in DITA. Because as long as you use a subset of DITA, you're good to go. You're, you're using, uh, you're staying well within the standard. Okay, I see uh, there's only uh, 12 minutes left, so um, this might be might be good to uh, spend the rest of um, rest of my time today for answering some questions. Um, I did have a couple of uh, demos for uh, um, live data editing on the website, etc. But you know, you'll just have to shoot me an email to ask for that kind of demo. And also I can, I can, um, I should invite you to my talks um, next week. Um, I have no less than five appearances at TC World. There's going to be uh, the Young's FrameMaker Circus, the D3JS Visualization Primer, and an introduction to XSLT. So if you are in Stuttgart next week, uh, do stop by in one of my talks. Um, two of those talks are going to be workshops that are going to go for two hours, and they're both scheduled twice. Uh, XSLT uh, introduction is just a presentation. 
Apart from that, there's going to be something really special, and I'm thrilled to do that. I've been asked to perform with the TC World Band on the Wednesday evening in the social event. I'm going to sing a couple of songs that are listed here. And um, if that's not enough, then the week after that, I'm going to be talking about Dita marrying Data at the Munich uh, Data Europe event this year. So um, if you want to get in touch, uh, all of my handles like yeah. Facebook, LinkedIn, and so Twitter are all forever young. I'm trying to keep things simple. There was a lot of And of course, there. you can always uh, contact me <clears throat> or Tom through the common era. Roger Kinney wrote, so this explanation uh, have, um, is truly amazing. I wish this topic the was explained in this fashion years ago. I hope that we can obtain the recording of this to explain to our buying influences. I'm not sure if I can uh, read questions. Supriya Bish um, said, right, it, it appears very okay, simple can, with the, uh, this explanation. And, yeah. Well, it is. If, if you have frame 2015 and DITA 1.3, it is. DITA 1.2, nah, not so much. You know, it's, it's, there was a reason that the EDDs were redesigned. So there, there is a reason. And basically, you know, some people might think that they are not ready to move to DITA 1.3 because they haven't mastered DITA 1.2 yet. Okay, since, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, we're waiting for some questions to come in and uh, there's... Um, there's always a lot more to talk about. Uh, I did prepare something else with the ExtendScript stuff, also related to DITA, that uh, I, I still have a couple of minutes to show you, and I wouldn't want to keep you from seeing that because I'm, I'm really happy with, uh, with that. Um, and it is truly amazing what you can do with a combination of you know, the strong EDDs, but also the ExtendScript. Um, let me just... Um, open a file here and then show you what's going to happen with this one. Uh, so I've been talking about data. This is all data. This is a database. Uh, we've done this for Never, And this topic has been published to, um, to a website that is specially meant for, um, for doing the review. And this is, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's become possible because we use FrameMaker as the, uh, the the point where the author gets all kinds of comments from the SME, but the SME is putting in the comments in the in the server using just a browser where the data documentation is transferred transformed into HTML into editable HTML on the fly. Um, this was mentioned also by Tom yesterday, but I thought I'd just show you just a really quick demo of this. Here we have a, um, uh, I'm doing this because the, um, this page, because I'm simulating what it looks like in different devices. If I go here, let me just go really quick because I don't have a lot, to, a lot of time anymore. You can see that this is uh, the rendering on a desktop and the same thing would look different on a tablet. If I go here on a tablet, it will open up this figure in a separate window so that they can easily uh, zoom in and zoom out and then discard the window. And then the same content on a phone would look like this because I don't want to see any of those uh, images on a phone because it doesn't make sense. But what I can do is here, if I go into this review, this was just a small mock-up to, to, to show the options. If I go into in here as an editor, what I can do is I can make changes. And this is just standard browser. It's an HTML5 standard browser. If I now save the changes and I go over, I go back to FrameMaker, then I have this one menu here where it says import changes from the server. And look at that. It has changed this. It has pulled in the change from the HTML yeah. server yeah. right into my FrameMaker yeah. data form. Um, let's and make a separate webinar out of this machine. again. I, yes, there is. Um, well, there is one uh, one product uh, that is that is doing this, uh, the uh, the uh, design science product, um, and um, as Tom is already mentioning, also in the in the chat window, there has been a university project doing this. Um, it is um, 
at a certain point, I've been looking into the framework equations and trying to map them to uh, to something sensible in um, in data in in math and L myself. It doesn't seem to be a huge task because you already have the equation editor. And once you have those elements, it should be able to uh, with extension to uh, to create the uh, the markup for that. Um, it's just a matter of uh, you know where you put your effort and your money because design science does have a product that does that um, or dig out the university project that uh, that works. Um, there's different ways of going at it, but there's no technical reason why it wouldn't be possible to create something like that in extension. Nope, we can hear you, Young. Stefan, are you there? Us. <laughs> Stefan may have dropped out. I'm not sure, but uh, thank you so much, Young. Definitely appreciate it. Um, Did we lose the sound, or and great job, Is and thanks me? so much. Ah, okay. I guess I said something wrong, huh? <laughs>